because before I started Piton, I was the assistant dean at Georgetown's business school. I was in charge of career management for the MBAs as well as uh, in charge of the alumni. During my time there, I was able to see job acceptance rise from 63% uh, of students uh, graduating from uh, business school with jobs to 98%. So I've been able to see some nice successes. And prior to that, I was a vice president at Citigroup, where I ran international recruiting, and I also managed uh, some of the MBA training programs. In founding Piton, I have brought together uh, some, some great experts in the field on the recruiting side and on the military side. Uh, and I have two today, Chad Storley and Megan Andros. Uh, and Chad? I'll hand it over to you. Good morning, everyone. This is Chad Storley. I'm the author of Combat Leader to Corporate Leader and a, a second book entitled Battlefield to Business Success. And I have uh, fully dealt with and appreciate all the frustration that comes from leaving military service, translating your military experience, and trying to find how you can best uh, apply yourself in a, a corporate position and then also translate all of your military experience, how it can be best used and appreciated in a, in a commercial setting. I am a, uh, a retired uh, Army officer and then I also have experience in uh, General Electric and, uh, and Comcast. I uh, also help uh, Afterburner Incorporated uh, learn how they can best apply military veteran skill sets to, uh, to their business. Primarily what I specialize in is translating and applying military experience into business because that way that enables veterans to have the most productive and the most competitive uh, transition experience. Thank you, Anne. Hey, thanks, Chad. And we also have on, uh, on this call Megan Andros. Megan? Hello, Megan. My name is Megan Andros, and I am the Director of Business Development at Piton, and I'm a recently separated Army officer. Um, after graduating West Point, I served five years on active duty as an Ordnance Officer within the 1st Cavalry Division. At times while in the military, I was responsible for more than 100 soldiers, and I held positions such as I was the Senior Battalion Maintenance Officer, and I was my brigade's Senior Logistic Planner. And I spent one year deployed to Baghdad, Iraq during my time in the military. All right, back to you, Ann. Hey, thanks, Megan. So you can see... Um, that, you know, in putting together this class and delivering this class, we wanted to make sure that you all get uh, the experience and the ideas from those of us who have been on the recruiting side, those who are actually experiencing what you're experiencing uh, as a veteran, and those who have gone through that transition from military to corporate. And just, uh, there are a few of you who join the call as we're introducing ourselves. So, as I said, if you have any questions during the time, you can type them in in the question or the chat part of the GoToWebinar, and also we will be uh, recording this class, so you can always listen to it again. Okay, so <clears throat> the, the goal of career success, the sort of what I sort of say, the equation of career happiness, really comes down to knowing what you want plus getting what you want. And that's really what we want to focus on. That's what we focus on in career success. That's what we focus on uh, in career transitions and in approaching a career fair. There are times in our lives when those things come together. You know, you've identified a goal, you've achieved that goal, and it's as great as you had hoped. Perhaps you felt that at some time during your time in the military or meeting your spouse, choosing the school you wanted to go to. It's that time, that feeling that you have, that you know what you want and you know what you need to do to get there and then you go out and get it. And this is what we really want to help you achieve uh, with your career transition. And so we're going to be looking at these two parts of that equation, knowing what you want, which is often more the strategic side, uh, as well as getting what you want, the standing operating procedures, the tactics to help you get there. In order to do that, we're going to focus on uh, you know, these three things. We're going to focus on that strategy, that sort of knowing what you want. We're going to focus on some SOPs for actually approaching a career fair. Uh, and we're going to go over how you can prepare and go through uh, that rehearsal. 
So to begin, let's begin by sort of setting the situation. I'm going to hand it over to Chad Storley, who's going to share uh, with all of us the state of career change for veterans. Chad? Thanks, Anne. The, the, the biggest part is that, uh, that you're, what you're going to be faced with is really is planning your career transition. And the career fair is only one of those. So really you're looking at how to leverage this military experience into a second career. And the a career fair is just is only part of that. But then also you want to look about when you're doing your career planning, understanding the economy, understanding uh, what six what mistakes veterans do make so you don't make them yourself and then also to deal with uncertainty and then how to understand your choices so when you're looking at at your career plan and your career transition it, it's very easy uh, to get uh, sidetracked into only looking at uh, posted opportunities especially on the uh, on websites and the uh, the Wall Street Journal had had a really uh, great article yesterday that uh, described how people did uh, looked for opportunities and, and career transition when they were faced it with the problems of the 1930s depression and a big part of how they did it was they had a plan and they networked so they talked to friends they talked to other business professionals and they really looked how they could how they could translate their experiences. So uh, in the 30s, there was no internet, uh, but the the secret back then, like it is today, is to network and find other people who are interested in your own success and to look at how they could get out there. So that's really what we're talking about today. Is that how you create a career plan? Understand how to create a lot of opportunities for yourself and then how to fully leverage your military experience and translate that so companies understand what you've done understand how you can apply your past military experience to their success that's really what's going to make you successful today Anne. hey thanks I'll just move that on <coughs> to the next slide for you Chad I recently did a survey of of both employers and people that assist veterans that really understand hey what what is it that employers want and how can veterans best present themselves to to succeed so what employers say is that 90% believe that for for a military hire it's essential to to translate their experience into a way that that the business can use and Another great point for veterans, too, is that 83% state that it's vital or essential for, for veterans uh, to translate that into their company. So employers value military experience, and they want the military experience that veterans have to be used in their company because it, they know that that's going to be what's going to make their company successful. However, the, the gap right now is that only 8% of veterans can effectively translate their skills to the corporate world. And at the end of this presentation, we're going to have uh, some free resources that's on, that are on my website, combattocorporate.com. That's all one word, but that really help veterans effectively simply and understandably apply their military skills so a lot of times it's easy to get discouraged that you think that my military experience nobody understands it nobody wants it when in point of fact employers want it and they need it for their companies to be successful the challenge for the veteran is that you have to explain and understand how that military experience can be translated and applied to an employer. When you can do that, that is going to make you an incredibly effective candidate, not only as a veteran, but as a new employee and as someone who's going to get ahead in that organization. So stay tuned as we go through here, but your military skills are going to be what make you the best candidate 
and it's going to make you incredibly effective in your civilian career. Your challenge is you have to translate it so employers and organizations understand how they can best use your military skills in their companies. Anne? Hey, thanks, Chad. And I'll just uh, want to sort of back up what Chad just said because he's, he's absolutely right, and I, I really like the research that he's done on this. Uh, the fact that all of you are on this call uh, puts you ahead of a lot of your peers already because you're being prepared. And as somebody who's worked uh, in a lot of career stuff, but especially I've worked with a lot of career fairs, and it is a huge difference between the people who are prepared for a career fair uh, and the people who go into a career fair being unprepared. Uh, and so this is why this is probably, this class that we're teaching today is probably one of my favorite classes to teach. Um, Chad is also uh, has another nice slide that I thought uh, maybe, Chad, you could share with us about, about uh, the, what the skills are that veterans bring to employers. The, the, there's a, this is just a brief list of all the skill sets that, that military veterans can translate. The, the best parts of what military veterans bring for a business is their leadership and planning and, and problem solving skills. Uh, for example, at the top of the list you're looking at in the, mil set, in the military we did a lot of performance counseling which was ex which was really employee coaching, laying out for an employee or for a, a soldier, sailor, marine, or airman. Hey, this is the the this is how what you did. This is the standard of performance, and this is how you either exceeded or didn't exceed the standard. And this is going to be our plan for you to apply that. This type of performance coaching is very very rare in in the commercial commercial business world. There's a lot of talk of leadership, but there's very little leadership in action. And it's a great way for a veteran to really shine both in an interview, but also as they get into an organization. And so the fact that you know how to develop and assess an employee and, and bring them and make them their best is something that you can do. And so this what this list here is, is it's meant to be a quick list for you to, sh just to show you a small, a, just a small sample of everything that you can do. Uh, in the middle of the page, the creation of standard operating procedures, or SOPs, uh, used uh, in, in every service for, for every situation is a great way. I knew of a, uh, of a, a non-commissioned officer that uh, that got out and uh, he went to a factory and was, they were walking him through and doing an interview and he noticed there was uh, some trash, there was uh, a few uh, piles of, uh, of, of dust and, and dirt and so what he did is he said, hey, twice a day we're going to do something simple as a police call. We're going to go through, we're going to pick up trash, we're going to make sure that the area is safe and we're going to make sure that it's clean so everybody's got a really good work environment to get their stuff done. You know what? He cut accidents in that workplace, he improved morale, and he made it a greater place to work. So these are really simple ways that veterans can translate their skill sets and really apply the best of what they have for a company and to make them successful. And Hey, thanks, Chad. And just to repeat, this slide and the other slides, uh, uh, this slide and the slide following are both going to be online. So you'll be able to use, actually look at these words and make sure you talk about them when you're in the career fair. Chad, you want to talk about the action framework? With a lot of times, and this is something that I know I did, I really struggled with what was everything that I could do and bring both in my resume and then when I was talking to an employer about how to best translate and apply military skills and, and my background. And, and understand too, I was both in infantry and then a special forces officer, so I didn't have any of the, the great skills that a lot of logisticians, uh, people that are involved in technology. I was a uh, in, in infantry guy and then and then a, a special operations uh, 
soldier, how do I do this? So a lot of times when I looked at my skill sets and we looked at attributes, and, and the first one for this action framework was these attributes. And really what you want to do is you want, looking at the bottom of the page, is that you want to make yourself very unique against your civilian counterparts and you want to be uh, in a place that it's something that businesses really value. So you want to be up there in that upper right hand corner in that goal area. So you're very unique against your against the civilian counterparts that you're going against for a uh, for either for a job or for a promotion and you want to be up there where it's skills that businesses really want and need. So you want to be right up there in that goal area. So the first part that you that you look at are um, these attributes, and these are pos what I call positive employment characteristics. Uh, you show up on time. You have a great work ethic. You're trust area trustworthy. All things that veterans do. But what you want to make sure is that is only the initial part of what you have to offer. Next, uh, this uh, this these concrete skill sets. The C in the action framework. Uh, our certifications, language training, maintenance, uh, Microsoft Office or, or other computer programs that you may know. These, uh, while maybe not uh, directly uh, applicable, show your propensity and your ability to understand technology and learn technology in a workplace. Finally, the, the thing when you start to put these attributes together plus your concrete skill sets, then you look at how you can translate these military skill sets to business. Your planning, your coaching, your leadership, your biz ability to do uh, mitigate risk and then also improve an organization. That's really what's going to make you very, very competitive in the workplace. So this action framework is both the attributes for A, the concrete skill sets for C, and then translating these military skill sets for T. Because that is going to be what makes you uh, an absolute standout both as a uh, as a employment candidate and as an employee when you get into an organization. So use this framework and, and it, it's especially helpful too to have stories about uh, your work ethic or your trustworthy. Everybody, uh, it, if I go in and talk to an employer and say, you know what, I'm hard working. Okay, that's great. <clears throat> or best have a story. Did I tell you about the, the time over a three month period where I developed a series of village councils in uh, four different villages in Afghanistan and, and the effort that it took to plan and execute that. Already you've set yourself apart and then you can show how you can translate these to a business. Great ways, so the action framework is a, is a really good way for you to, to clearly and understandably lay out and translate your military skills and how they can apply to an employer and help that employer be even more successful. And Hey, thanks, Chad. And we will be referring back to this action network uh, in a few slides when we talk about preparing for walking through the day, the day of the career fair. So in terms of strategy, right, uh, the goal, uh, when you're setting your own strategy, the first thing you want to really know is what's the strategy of the other folks out there. So before I set my own strategy, I want to know what's the employer strategy? What's in it for them? So keep in mind that employers want to connect with candidates. Employers want to, they're there at a career fair because they want to see what the talent is that's out there. Uh, at the Cheney Stadium uh, career fair that will be happening September 2nd, they're going to be looking at military talent in the Washington State area. Uh, they're going to want to know how prepared are candidates coming in through the career fair as a whole. They're going to want to know, are there any standouts? They also wanted to see if anyone would fit into their particular company. Some of these employers will be getting a sense of what it's like to hire from the military for the first time, and some of them will be more educated about what it's like to hire from the military. Even companies that are not particularly hiring at that moment, they all know that there's going to be a war on talent in the future, and so they all want a pipeline of talent 
they want to know who you are out there. Second thing that employers want to do when they go to a career fair is they want to screen candidates on the spot. And I know those of you who are going to the Hire America's Heroes Fair, there is a chance to sign up for an informational interview. So if you haven't done that, uh, please do so, because that gives you a chance to get an employer to screen you on the spot. Employers want to get that chance to get their hands on you, and, and seeing you in person is, is such a big, uh, big difference between that and just reading a resume. This is a chance for them to also brand their organization, right? Good employers know that you're going to be asking your peers advice about choosing a company and choosing a career. So they want their brand as their company to be one that's known for understanding and appreciating veteran talent. They know the companies that are going to be there, they know that you may not work for that particular company. However, you may refer a friend to their company, you may become a client of that company, you may become a customer of that company. So those are some of the some of the key reasons why employers there. Megan, um, you're on the uh, call. You want to sort of add in any other thoughts on on employers coming to veterans career fairs? Yes. Uh, another thing I would add in is that uh, the companies who have chosen and signed up to attend this career fair are there and are doing so because they genuinely want to hire people like us, veterans, and they value what we bring to the table. And I think uh, as someone attending the career fair you can kind of put your mind at ease a bit because they want you. They're just looking for the right fit. Um, that's what I would add in. Hey, thanks. And, and, and Megan actually has had um, some good experience going to career fairs as a recent uh, uh, vet herself. So like I said, if you have any questions that you send in, we can always make sure that we can answer them the best that we are able. So once you understand what the employer's purpose is, the next thing is to set your own strategy. What's your purpose? and what's in it for you. Um, the first thing I would say is you really want to understand the market. The second is to plan and prepare for applications in, in, and interviews, those that are going to be there at the career fair as well as in the future. And then finally, it's important to expand your network. Um, so. I'm going to hand it over, I'm going to go to the next slide to just start off and talk about understanding the, the market. Uh, as Chad said earlier, there's oftentimes a, uh, there's a, there's a gap between what, what folks coming out of the military know about the skills that, that they have uh, that are going to translate into a civilian job. So probably one of the first things and most important things you can do at a career fair is really gain knowledge that's going to help you not only get your next job, but also making decisions for your long-term career. So one of the first things I would do is sort of is look at what can I learn about the functions and industries. So functions and industries. A function is what you're going to be doing, right? Leading a team, managing a budget, selling a product, organizing. Industries are where you're going to be doing it. The private sector, the public sector, manufacturing, banking. Um, those, are the, those are the two different areas that you want to be looking at and beginning to ask the questions, are the functions that people are looking for skills that I have and are the industries an industry that I'm interested in? And so be, be, be prepared to ask these questions to yourself and have them answered in the career fair. Where are the jobs that you want located? Is there a transferable market for the jobs you're going into? What's the future of the industry uh, that, that you're going into? Um, Megan, do you want to add uh, anything to understanding the market? Uh, yes, Ann. Um, I have two things that I would add here. Uh, first, there are a few publications that I've found myself as a transitioning veteran that have been useful and will help you understand the business world. First, the Wall Street Journal, try to read that every day. Fortune Magazine, Vault.com is a great website. So is wetfeet.com. And then also pick up a copy of Chad's book, Combat Leader to Corporate Leader, and visit his website. And those are all things that can help you kind of get a feel for the business environment. Secondly, I would say that many recruiters from companies are going to try to push you in to take a job that's close as possible to, to what you were doing in the military, which is sometimes a great path, especially to get right into a company. And it's often the one of least resistance, but it's not the only way to go. And if you want to make a change, you have to put in the time and do the work. 
Um, transitioning from the military is an ideal, ideal time to make a career change because of the natural break. It allows you to consider other functions and other industries. So just don't let anyone put you in a specific box because of the job that you had in the military. That's, that's, those are the two things I would add, Ann. Hey, thanks, Megan. That's great advice. Chad, do you have anything to add before I go to the next slide? It's uh, it's often often best when you uh, are are doing a lot of this research to to really help drill down. So, for example, Amazon is uh, is one of the uh, really uh, great companies that's out there in the Pacific Northwest, and so you can look at them and say, hey, Amazon, they're uh, they're building a lot of these what they call these fulfillment centers, which help them get their product, both books and and other consumer good out to out to customers. So they're doing a lot of warehousing, a lot of shipping, and uh, understanding this is how the company is starting to grow. This is what they're doing to uh, fulfill their growth, and then understanding how you can fit in to help them do that. So that way, you you really uh, think of it as a funnel where you take all this information, uh, both from the sources that, that Megan talked about and really drill it down to, this is what the company is doing and this is where I can help them succeed. That's what really helps make a lot of this understanding very real to you and to, uh, to the uh, recruiters at a career fair. Anne? Hey, thanks. Okay, so that's the, that's the first reason that you, you know, when you're setting your strategy, for going to a career fair. The next one is planning and preparing for interviews. Um, and one of the reasons, uh, one of the things you really want to achieve at a career fair is to be prepared for that, that big interview, what we refer to as the at-bat, right? Um, these days, in this economy, you often only get one at-bat in applying for a job or for interviewing. So the career fair is going to allow you to gather as much information as you can and take practice swings at answering questions, right? Use this time at the career fair to understand what skills the employers are looking for, what characteristics they're looking for. And this goes back, again, I, talk, I say the word skills and characteristics. This is how, you know, Chad was talking about attributes. Um, you know, the whole ACT, this is, this is where you can really use this in a career fair. Um, so what are the skills they're looking for? Are they looking for quantitative skills, leadership skills, decision-making skills, communication skills? Do you have the skills they're looking for? And could you get them if you needed to? And then also it's the time to look at, to understand what characteristics uh, of company that you might be interested in is looking for. Um, are they looking for someone with an entrepreneurial spirit? State Farm Insurance, which is uh, based in the Pacific Northwest, but it's nationwide, they're often looking for people with a strong entrepreneurial spirit. Or is this a place where teamwork is the most important characteristic? Uh, or is it being able to work independently or the ability to be very flexible? These characteristics are, are, and understanding them are important for two reasons. One, choosing the best fit company. But two, making sure that you let the employer know that you have the characteristics that they're looking for. So, and, and again, this comes back to what uh, Chad was talking about in the beginning of this webinar, is that gap of knowledge between people who, are, people who want to hire veterans and understanding what skills and characteristics they bring. Most employers have a general understanding of the characteristics of military men and women as a whole. And you ask them and they'll, they'll bring up words like integrity and leadership and responsibility. But it's really up to you to highlight the characteristics that you as, a, as an individual possess that will make you a good fit. And, they, and these may be characteristics and skills that someone who's recruiting didn't even know that a person in the military might have. So this is when uh, practicing your pitch is so important. So again, you're going to want to use the career fair to see how your pitch works, right? Uh, and when we say your pitch, it's sort of your elevator speech, the way you introduce yourself. This is your chance to see how people react to your introduction. And you watch what works, and you watch what part of your introduction is interesting to the employer when you're talking to them, and what part about describing yourself and your background doesn't seem to be making a positive uh, impact. Megan, do you want to add anything to this?
Uh, yes, Ann. I would add that, um, actually, I'm not going to add. I'm going to pass. Sorry, right. go back to you, Ann. <laughs> we'll, let you, we'll let you pass on that one. Um, and actually, I want to go to the next slide, and, um, which is expanding your network, which is one of the, the third reasons why you really want to take advantage of being at a career fair. And actually, I'm going to hand this one to Chad. Chad, do you want to leave this slide off? Sure. The, the best part of, of a career fair is that there are, there, there are employers there, they're ready to look at you, and they're, and they're ready to hire. But it's also a great way for you to understand, hey, other contacts that are out there, other companies, and to really make connections with the people on, on a personal level. Uh, websites uh, really just display opportunities, but they don't display all the opportunities. When you have a network, they help you understand what opportunities are out there that, that may not be publicized, they, and they also help you to see what are the qualifications that companies are looking for, and what are some questions that, uh, that companies have. And so when you look at a network, it's your, your contacts with, with you there in the center, uh, but other company contacts, contacts that may be in the industry, and uh, you yourself may help be a, a connector to other people, either for information, or for uh, an opportunity. So even though a company may not have an opportunity at this time, that does not mean that that company or people at that company are not people that you want to connect to because they may refer you to someone or you could uh, stay in contact with them and then you'll see the opportunity later on in the future. And, and finally, uh, one of the, the great ways of networking is uh, when you meet someone, always be professional because you never know where that contact and that opportunity could lead. Anne? Hey, thank, thanks, Chad. Um, now, uh, before we're going we're gonna to go into sort of the, the pregame, the game day, the sort of game on, we'll sort of walk you through what that career fair is going to be like for you, the next career fair you do. But before we do, I want to focus on two concepts. Uh, one is uh, sort of tags onto this slide, what we call the four stages of a job opening. And the second is to talk about what we call the pace, um, the, the pace plan of careers and transition. So let me start with what we call the four stages of a job opening. And this has a lot to do with networking. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about networking and how to network, uh, we do have a class that I think is already recorded uh, that you can watch about, um, about networking. But the four stages of the job opening go sort of like this. To begin with, companies are always on the lookout for talent. If you ask any CEO, you ask them what the most important thing is for them, and it's getting good, it's getting good talent. So companies are always keeping their eyes open, even in a tough economy, to get people who have good talent. The second stage of a job opening is when a company or a business group has a need, but they haven't figured out what the job is going to be. They might be saying that, uh, you know, as Chad referred to in that story, we're our productivity is down, we're having too many uh, accidents in our manufacturing site, we need to have somebody come in and, and make this work. So they know they have a need, but they haven't quite figured out what the job is going to be. The third stage in a job opening is when you have the job. You've gotten the approval to hire somebody, and you're looking internally, you're asking people, do you know of anybody who might be a good fit for the job? So the first thing you're doing at that point is you're looking around to who you know. And then the final stage of a job opening is when it's been posted online, when it's on an online website, when it's out in, to, to, the, to, to the whole universe. So the important thing about understanding these four stages of the job opening is how important networking can be to get you into a job. During these first two stages, basically you're competing with yourself. During these few first few stages, a company may see you, they don't even know that they need someone like you until they've met you. So getting out there, um, you know, and networking 
can help you find the jobs before they've even been decided. And that third part, of course, is looking for referrals. If you're, like, like Chad's saying, if you're out there and connecting and building your network, um, you're more likely to get the call to say, hey, this job just got posted. I think you ought to apply for it. And then finally, once it opens to the universe, uh, once it goes online, that doesn't mean don't apply. But the fact is, if you've been doing a lot of networking, you're far more likely to have an application that really matches what the company is looking for. So try to keep this in mind in terms of looking long term when you're setting up your networking, and especially when you're approaching a career fair. Now, the second part about uh, that when it comes to approaching a career fair is the targeted approach versus the scattershot approach. Uh, and it's an interesting balance. You want to make sure that you're tightly focused on looking at companies where you know you want to work, where you know you have a match, but not necessarily close your eyes to something that might be interesting that you don't know about. And I think uh, Chad's concept of the PACE plan really works here. Chad, could you share that with us? Sure. One of the uh, the best ways when you're looking at, at career transition is to uh, not just have uh, one plan or one company or one job that that you want to get to. And and in the uh, uh, special operations, we used a a concept called PACE, which stood for primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency, or uh, in and so what we would do is, for example, if we had a, a casualty evacuation, we would have, okay, this is the primary way that we're going to uh, evacuate somebody that was wounded. Perhaps it was a helicopter. An alternate method would be through a, through a vehicle to a ground hospital and, and so on down the line. And this, this same concept really works well for a career transition because it really helps you plan to both look at different uh, geographic areas to live, different industries and then uh, and, and companies in those industries and then also occupations with things that you can do. So for example, uh, we'll, when you're talking your career transition, there may be a couple of primary companies, but then you start to go alternates and contingencies. And really what this does is this opens your eyes to the full range of opportunities that are out there and it makes you look and anticipate that the primary opportunity may not work out and so you have to have an alternative. Because if you have a lot of these uh, contingencies in mind, then you're really going to plan your transition well and anticipate that you may not be successful with one. But if you have a lot of op opportunities identified and laid out, then one of them or m multiple ones of them will help you be successful. Anne? Hey, thanks. Um, and this, this PACE plan, I found when I talked to, to veterans who were going through the career transition, thinking in this manner has resulted in, in making really good strategic plans for career transition. So I really like the way this works. So let's talk about uh, getting ready for the next career fair. Uh, again, we're going to talk pregame first. Um, the, the success at the career fair is absolutely directly proportional to the amount of preparation you put in ahead of time. And I can tell you that from being a recruiter at a career fair. I can tell you that from being um, a career coach at a career fair. You can tell who's done the preparation ahead of time. So we really want to make sure that you're, you're doing that. Here are some of the first things I would absolutely do in the week before a career fair. Absolutely, first thing is get a list of who's attending. For this career fair that's going to be happening at Cheney Stadium, you can get, uh, I believe, this information at Reg Online or at the HireAmericasHeroes.org site. But for any career fair, find out who's going to be coming to the career fair. Then I make, now I refer to them as ABC lists, and Chad refers to them as PACE. Um, but again, the sort of secret of success at a career fair is targeting. So you want to take that list of employers that you've got. You've got a list of who's attending. And 
you want to you want to find out are there any particular jobs that are going to be listed already and I would really advise you making an A-list of the few employees where you know you'd like to work and you see a very obvious match because this is your chance to make an impression on them so you want to read their website you want to go on to LinkedIn if you're not on LinkedIn uh, let us know and we'll make sure that you get set up with that you want to know everything you can about that company and that job um, you don't want to have to ask anything that when you meet that company that you could have gotten from the website and you want to be able to articulate why that company is interesting to you and again for that B list you want to be able to so the B list would be you know a company that you know you think you might be a good match you may not know a particular job that matches um, or you may not be a hundred percent sure but so for that A list and that B list you want to make sure that you've gone onto their website and then when I say the C list I would always note a few companies that you don't know enough to categorize but you think they might be worth a look um, you know I, I Bing or Google each one of those find out what they do um, and just put them on the go see list uh, because sometimes you can be surprised that a company that you never thought of might be a great fit for you um, Chad or Megan anything on the pregame Nope, and I don't have anything to comment. Okay, let me go over. I'm going to just, again, I just want to show you another visual about the prioritize and the A, B, and C list, which match up with the whole pace, right? So we might say the P would be an A list. Um, so for a few of these, you want to make sure that you've researched. If, if a company is going to be your A company or your primary company, do you know all the job openings? Do you have a resume? And if you can begin to target your resume specifically to that company, even better. I would say for any company that you really are interested in, write down why you think they might hire you and note how you might overcome any reasons why they might not hire you. If you can begin to answer that question, you're going to be prepared when you go in there. And again, the B, look at their website, and C, check out their website. For those of you who are going to the career fair, the Hire America's Heroes uh, Career Fair at Cheney Stadium, you'll have the chance to do informational interviews. So again, for that primary um, or A, I would make sure that all of you who are going apply for one or two informational interviews. You'll also be at this career fair a chance to sign up for practice interviews, a chance to practice interviewing and be videotaped. If any of you, if you've never watched yourself being interviewed, it can be a humbling experience, uh, but it's one of the best ways to become a better interviewer. And then also at this career fair and at other, especially veteran career fairs, they're often coaching kiosks, a chance to talk to somebody who's been in your position. Take advantage of these. Um, make sure that if you have any downtime, that that's what you're doing in your downtime. Okay, so now let's go on to game day. So for those of you who are going to be uh, going to the career fair on September 2nd, uh, game day, uh, the day of the event, number one thing, get dressed. Um, I think wearing clothes is always very important when you're going to a career fair. Uh, that is not optional. Uh, employers, as far as I know, are not really big on naked candidates. Um, now. Chad had talked and we talked about the employers really only have a few moments to make a decision about you. They really make uh, a decision on very few data points that they have. You meet someone for a few seconds and you make a decision. Are they a fit or, not they, or are they not a fit? So choosing your wardrobe is going to really give uh, the employer some data points to make a decision whether they're interested in talking to you. So when you're, when you're dressing, you don't need to wear the most expensive suit, but you do want to play to, uh, to your strengths. And one of the strengths that, that employers see about people in the military is they see that they're off, they, they often believe that people who come out of the military are very organized and responsible. So you want to make sure that the way you dress reflects that, having clothes that fit well making sure that you don't have a button missing, 
Uh, if, if you're looking at companies where you're going to be wearing a suit, then you want to be wearing a suit. Um, but making sure that you look very clean and neat and pressed is more important than wearing something uh, expensive. Uh, and also you want to be comfortable. Being in a career fair, you're often in a big place with cement floors. This is not a time to be trying out new shoes and certainly not a time to be wearing high heels. If you feel like you need to be wearing heels, um, do make sure that you wear something that's solid that you can walk in. Um, so, uh, and like I said, most career fairs are not on comfortable floors. Uh, what are you going to bring with you? Uh, bring tissues. Runny, runny noses do not work well in career fairs. Bring mints. It's going to boost your confidence if you sort of pop a mint in your mouth. Bring a portfolio. Um, you can pick one up at a Walmart or a Target. They're not very expensive. Uh, just a nice sort of portfolio or pad folio where you can take notes, where you can keep maybe a copy of your resume or a business card, and where you can collect information. I usually have a dark one that looks professional. Um, and if you're a, a woman, don't bring a purse that's too big. It should match with your whole professional outfit. Um, the other thing that you want to be doing on your game day, uh, the day of the game, uh, is practicing your pitch, right? So the day of the career fair, you need to say your introduction out loud. Not in your head, not, but you need to hear your own voice. And uh, this, again, we see a real big difference between people who have practiced introducing themselves out loud and people who just sort of think they know what they're going to say and then go in uh, not as prepared as they should be. So before you walk into that career fair, you need to practice uh, your introduction uh, out loud. Uh, and then, uh, you know, finally, visualize success. The best job seekers focus like professional athletes. Visualize yourself walking into the event. Visualize how you're going to carry yourself. Think about what kind of facial expression you want to have. Um, some of the feedback that we've received from recruiters at military career fairs is they see people looking glum. So the face that you may have that you're hoping presents a sense of seriousness and responsibility may be a little too overpowering. So consider what kind of face, facial expression are you going to have? Are you going to have a ready smile? Because these these things, if you think about them, you'll be more prepared when you walk through. Um, Chad or Megan, anything you want to add on the, uh, the day of the career fair? And I, I would say that this, this game day approach is going to be the same approach for when you are going to do to visit a company for an informational interview or for a, a full series of, of interviews because you, you're going to do the same thing. Uh, a, a, a great approach, too, for the, for the game day, too, especially for when you go to a company. If you've not visited that company before, make sure you do a test run to the location so you can find it. You know where parking is. You know what traffic patterns are. Uh, and you, you can definitely find it because uh, it's definitely you don't want to be late ever for an interview and you always want to be earlier on time and this whole approach about getting dressed visualizing your success practicing your pitch and then making sure that you have uh, a few extra copies of your resume because uh, You'd never know if, if you're there for an interview and somebody likes you, hey, here's two other people I want you to talk to. Are, are you ready for, the, for that? For that? So are you ready to be successful? It, it really helps to have that same standardized approach to, uh, to every type of interview or, uh, or career fair experience. Anne? Thanks, Chad. Uh, before I move on, Megan, do you have anything to add or should I go on to the game, game on? Uh, the only thing I would add in is that I, I've been recently at career fairs where um, prospective job seekers aren't wearing professional clothing or maybe are wearing sneakers. And, and for ladies, again, talking about the uncomfortable flooring, it's important that you wear heels or at least a shoe with some type of heel 
Um, it's very important because it shows that you're professional and you're serious about trying to find a job. So I, I do think that this is a very important um, aspect of attending a career fair. That's all I have, Ian. Great, thanks. I think that's I think that's really good to sort of and and the way that Chance said to make sure you know you're going. Try on, you know, if you can, going back, if you can try on what you think you're going to wear before, you, before you know, you're about to walk out the door, try on what you think you're going to wear to the career fair the day before, you'll notice if there, if there are uh, any issues. And one more thing about game day is once you're on, and we're going to go into game on, once you're on, you're on. And I can tell you as a recruiter, I see you when you come up to my booth, but I also see you when you're hanging out in line for the restroom. I can see you when you're, when you're walking around talking to somebody else. So again, looking professional, standing professional, um, and being comfortable is, is really important. Okay, so game on. You guys are going, you're going into the career fair. Here's the plan of attack that I would recommend and that I've seen that works best. Number one, go to practice companies first. You've already figured out what that key company is that you want to meet and the company that you know you think you'd, you'd have a great career at. Hold your horses on that. Go to a B-list or a C-list company first and practice with them. <clears throat> you want to also avoid waiting in line. People will sort of, once there's a line standing in front of a booth, people sort of tend to get in the line behind it. If you see that there is you know, too many people at one booth, swing around and come back again. Oftentimes these lines go up and down. If you really like uh, a certain company, try to meet as many people. If, there are more than, if there's more than one person in that booth or at that table, meet as many people in the booth as possible. Check your notes before going to see the company. Um, again, if you're, if there's a company that's really interesting, you know, you can swing by again. Uh, you certainly don't want to be a stalker, but again, you, you want to be, uh, you want to be able to go and, and get to know them. Um, and sometimes, and I think with, with many of these career fairs, there'll be private receptions afterwards. So if you're invited to a, a reception or to follow up with a company, make sure that you do that. Uh, and when you meet somebody, uh, if, you get your, if you get their card, you want to send, if you can, a thank you note uh, if you're interested in following up with them within 48 hours. Um, I'm going to break down now just the sort of what I would say the standard operating procedure of going to a booth. Now, I've referred to it as a booth. Sometimes at a career, tail, uh, a, a career fair, it will just be a table. But here's the sort of SOP that I would recommend for going to each company. Before you go to the company, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to check your notes. If this is a company you're interested in, you've probably printed out notes about what you know about them. You probably have looked at what jobs they have. You've looked at the web. So check their note. Check your notes. Remember why you're interested in that company. The next is to wait patiently. Uh, make sure you've got a, a pleasant face. You're standing straight and comfortable. Uh, people will judge you. People make decisions on very small uh, pieces of data, as I said, and sometimes without even realizing it. So you want to make sure that you're standing comfortably, hands at your sides. Um, you want to make sure that you don't have your sort of arms crossed in front of you or, or uh, you know, hands behind your back or hands on your hips. Uh, something, you're, you're sort of sending that body language, which is going to make a, um, an important uh, impact. Uh, for those of you who have, get nervous and have sweaty hands, it is not an uncommon thing. Uh, we call it the wipe. Before you stand up and say hello to somebody, you're just going to very casually make sure that you press your right hand against, against your trousers or your skirt to make sure that your hand is as dry as possible. You stand up, you make eye contact, you smile, and please don't forget to smile, and you shake your hand. You shake their hand. Introduce yourself, and we're going to talk about how to introduce yourself, uh, and ask a question. So make sure if you're going up there, you've checked your notes, you've waited in line, you, you get your moment, 
you make your eye contact, you smile, you shake hands, you introduce yourself, you ask a question. Ask for and give cards if it feels like it's appropriate. So if you have business cards, this is a time to ask and to ask, you know, could I follow up with you? Do you have a business card? Sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. Please don't forget to say thank you after you've spoken to them. Thank you. Now the next, the final part in the operating procedure for approaching a company is when you step away, put the card away, take a pen and write down what happened in that, in that meeting. It can take 15 seconds to write it down. Here's what I said, here's the name of the person I met, here's what we talked about, so you'll know what to follow up with. Chad or Megan, do you want to jump in on this? Hey, and uh, one thing, one thing that I would add that if you go and have a, a bad experience at a booth or something like that, just shake it off, uh, smile, pat yourself on the back, and 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 move on, because no one is expecting you to be perfect because they themselves aren't perfect. So there are a lot of great opportunities. There are a lot of multiple opportunities, both to have interactions. So don't let uh, one interaction or if you stumble with your elevator speech, don't let that ruin your day. Understand that this is stressful for everybody and that everybody wants the best for you. Hey Chad, that's excellent advice and, and I see that as a recruiter. It actually impresses me if somebody sort of stumbles over to an introduction and then I can see them go and pick themselves up and going and going out and talking to other companies and continuing to keep a smile on their face. So we notice that as recruiters. So not only is it important for you uh, to not, you know, not lose your focus if you have a bad interaction, but it's also, uh, it also should be noticed that, that we use that as a way to judge your ability to get through a career transition. I'm going to break down uh, the pitch because we, we've talked about the, the pitch. We've talked about how to introduce yourself. I like to break it down into sort of, uh, sort of five easy, easy pieces, right? The pitch is basically telling your story. You start out with the introduction, who are you? Then you give me some key skills, experiences, characteristics that I need to know about you. You give me three. And then you tell me where you'd like to take these skills and experiences. So one, who are you? two, three, four, a key skill, a key experience, a key characteristic, and then five, where would you like to take these skills and experiences? So introduction, this is what I need to know about you. Here's the second thing I need to know about you. Third thing I need to know about you, and where would you like to take these skills and experiences? I'll, I'll give you an example of an Air Force staff sergeant. Uh, that I was working with. Uh, his pitch, again, was I was an Air Force Staff Sergeant managing life support operations of an F-16 fighter aircraft squadron. I have safety and risk management expertise. This role has provided me with excellent communication and motivation experience with coworkers, and I have top security clearance. And then I'm planning to transfer these skills and experiences to a health and safety role in manufacturing. So five steps, keeping it clean, taking out the ums and ahs and, and sort of walk, walks of other information. That's how you're going to be the most successful with the pitch. Megan, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, Anne. Um, I would add that while presenting your pitch, make sure to speak slowly and to make eye contact with the recruiter. Um, after presenting a successful pitch, the recruiter you're speaking with will often ask you follow-up questions about skills or experiences that you mentioned. They may also ask you to go into more detail about your work ex experiences or may ask questions about certain situations you've been in or decisions you've made uh, while in a leadership position. If your pitch was successful, your conversation will flow smoothly. But don't be surprised, however, if you have some hiccups along the way, which is fine, it happens to everyone, and that's why it makes sense to practice practice. That's it, Ann. Back to you. Hey, thanks, Megan. And Megan, uh, Megan App certainly speaks from experience because I know that you've gone to a couple of career fairs recently. Um, and one of the things that, that Megan used that we talk about is using the battle buddy uh, strategy. 
So I'm going to jump in on this, and then I'm going to have Megan and, and Chad share uh, some of their, their uh, thoughts. Um, battle buddy strategy, this is not a zero-sum game. Um, by paying attention to you, just because they want you doesn't mean that they don't want another veteran, right? So if you can look good in a career fair, if you can make someone else look good in a career fair, everyone wins. And teamwork really has its benefits. So I would say pick a battle buddy to work the room with if you can. You can use that person to practice your pitch with. You can do a recon if you're interested in a company but you're not quite sure uh, what they do. You can have them go over and get information. You can introduce each other. Um, and I love that as a recruiter when somebody would meet with me and then come back and introduce me to one of their peers. And you can also talk to somebody for moral support. Because again, you're putting yourself, you're putting yourself out there. And if you're going to put yourself out there, um, it's going to, it, it can impact your morale. Megan, do you want to add to that? Uh, yes, Anne, I would uh, add that I know some people are concerned that if they bring along a bad battle buddy, their battle buddy might, quote unquote, steal their thunder. Um, I would say to that that you may fit into the corporate co company of a culture, or sorry, into the corporate culture of a company, or you may not. Uh, for you, it's going to be all about finding the right fit. And none of the companies that you'll see at the career fair are one size fits all companies. And you'll find your way to the right company, which is why the battle buddy strategy works well. Additionally, Many of you may be intimidated or nervous, and I can speak from experience in that, uh, at the beginning of the career fair. One way to help yourself ease into speaking with corporate recruiters is uh, to use the battle buddy system. Visiting booths with a battle buddy helps make the conversation flow smoothly, lessens the chance that you'll encounter awkward silences, and, and really don't, be, don't worry again about being competitive with your buddy. Just try to find the company that you'll fit in. Um, that's really, uh, and, and actually lastly I would say too, if you're feeling confident, and you feel like you've gotten the hang of visiting the booth with your buddy, maybe try visiting companies from your A-list on your own after you've, after you've done a little bit of networking with your buddy. Back to you, Ann. Hey, thanks, Megan. Um, and we're running towards the um, wrapping up the end of this webinar, but I want to focus on um, some serious etiquette for networking. Chad, do you want to um, talk about this? Sure. Uh, one of the th uh, just one of the parts that I would add about working with a with a battle buddy is I I, I think that it it's a great time um, when if you see someone that they that they could improve, just keep the, these two things in mind. Just be kind and be helpful, because if if you have that in mind, be kind and be helpful, then you're really well prepared both to receive and to offer feedback. Uh, it, it really helps because there's uh, a lot going on, a lot, a lot to improve, and, and that really helps you uh, get the most from, from ever, every uh, reaction and interaction. Uh, I, I will just touch on some of, the, some of the main points here, and then I will let uh, Ann and, uh, and, and Megan offer, offer some of their, their really uh, excellent advice. I, I think that... Being overprepared helps you relax and helps you smile. Because if you're overprepared, then you are confident and you're ready and you're relaxed. If you're not, then you feel rushed and unsure of yourself, and that and that really really ref will can can reflect on you, and and someone won't know why. I I think that. Uh, uh, one of the other things that I'll, that I'll offer too is uh, is with uh, with networking, um, especially if there's going to be any type of uh, of alcohol involved, is that one drink and nurse it the entire night. Uh, there, alcohol can be used as a way uh, to to see how how well you do with it, and so if you stick with one. You're going to demonstrate yourself that you're fully responsible. There's uh, no, you will never get in trouble by having just one drink or having no alcohol. Never ever get in trouble with that. And then I would also too is that most companies in in the the United States have uh, 
either a a limited or no tobacco use too. So it, especially if you're coming from a deployed location where uh, tobacco use is fully acceptable, uh, both uh, both smoking and dipping in in most corporate cultures is is not acceptable. So just understand that uh, it's. We can all have our own opinion about tobacco use, but uh, just understand that that most companies will uh, will not uh, will not do it, and uh, just very much to be aware of. But uh, I, I love the people that are that smile, because people that smile are relaxed and they're really showing themselves to be open to the uh, networking experience. And Hey, thanks. And Megan, do you want to jump in on, on any of the, these etiquette questions? Uh, yes, Anne. I would, I would add that uh, everyone, every individual leaves the military for a variety of reasons. And regardless of how your experience in the military was, whether you loved it or hate it, hated it, during these conversations, it really won't do you any favors to badmouth your previous employer. First of all, it's going to make the recruiter you're speaking to wonder if you'll speak badly about their company once you're employed, and no one likes quote-unquote traitors. Uh, also, by speaking poorly about the military, oftentimes you'll discredit your own resume. And uh, so I just would like to add, just, just don't talk badly about the military or the VA, because uh, it's really not going to help you in your search. Um, that's all I have, Ann. Hey, thanks, Megan. Great advice. Um, and then finally, um, just want to talk about things. It's not personal. If you hear people say, you know, don't give me a resume, send it to the website, that often has more to do with uh, human resources law, something called OFCCP. Um, don't worry if somebody says, well, I don't make any just hiring decisions here. I'm just because I'm just here because, you know, they sent me out or, you know, thanks. We're not looking for anybody like you. You're going to be hearing these things. Make sure you have a smile on, on your face uh, and keep sort of plugging away uh, because it's how you get through those kind of tough times that are going to make the difference uh, in being successful in the long term. As we're wrapping up, I want to uh, take, a take a moment to highlight some of the resources uh, that are out there for you. There are just so many resources out there, um, and sometimes it can be almost overwhelming. But uh, Chad Storley has his website, Combat to Corporate, uh, and on his website, he has, if you can see up at the top, it's, um, it's sort of cut out here in red. He's got a tab called Resources. And it's a good place to, it's one of my go-to places to find out about, uh, about you know, different pieces of information. And he has some good things that you can actually download. So I would definitely recommend going to Chad's site. I think he does great work. That's why you know, I'm so fortunate to be able to work with him. And then also on my website, on Piton, uh, inc.org, there are also uh, places where you can uh, get information. On both our sites, we're going to be recording this class, and so you'll be able to hear parts of it again or download it to, uh, to, to keep it with you. Um, also, if there are any questions that we weren't able to answer or any questions that we answered one-on-one -on -one, um, that, um, that we think are appropriate for everyone to hear, We'll be putting it on my blog. So again, that's pitoninc.org. Um, and here is my uh, contact information as well. We'll be following up uh, with you uh, later, you know, in, a, in about a day to make sure that if you had any questions and to get your feedback. I think uh, of being prepared and going to a career fair is probably one of the best things you can do for getting that first job as well as for preparing yourself for a long-term career. So I wish you all the best of luck, um, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, uh, Megan, and thank you so much, Chad Storley.